back. I'm honored uh, to be in, invited to speak again. Um, I hope some of you saw uh, my presentation that I did before on the uh, celebrating the birds of the Chicago area. I had a good time with that. And um, today we're all in for a treat because there is no place I'd rather be right now if I could wave a magic wand is to be in Costa Rica. Um, this is a, a beautiful Central American country. And um, it's, it's one of the, well, it's one pen country in a way for sure where Americans are extremely well liked. And uh, in November, 2017, National Geographic named Costa Rica, the happiest country in the world. Our uh, State Department considers Costa Rica among the safest destinations for US citizens. So having told you all of that, I will also tell you that I've been there four times. And if I could wave a magic wand, I'd be there right now. It is simply a wonderful destination. Um, and um, I'm gonna move along and show you a few reasons why it has a lot to offer not just magnificent birds, remarkable reptiles and weird and wonderful mammals, but lots of other stuff too. So um, we are, uh, Costa Rica is, as you can see, just above Panama and below Nicaragua, over on the lower right, that's South America, and you can see Cuba and, and uh, Mexico. Um, in a little country, uh, it has a lot of variety. Uh, it has mountains, it has lowlands, it has oceans, the Pacific Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, uh, lakes, beaches, live volcanoes, rainforests, waterfalls, and wildlife galore. Uh, so it's a great destination for um, Americans. And, um, and size-wise, it's small, 288 miles long, on the linear uh, and 170 miles wide. It has 100, 805 miles of coastline, coastline and it's slightly smaller than our state of West Virginia. So um, the coastal plains that you see on either side are separated by rugged mountains in the middle of the country, which include more than 100 volcanic cones of which several are majorly active volcanoes. Arenal volcano that I will be showing you pictures of erupted in 2010, and it's the most active of, of the volcanoes in Costa Rica. Uh, a 1968 eruption destroyed the town of Tabacan, which we are going to actually be seeing. Um, so uh, that's of some uh, amazing interest. Uh, it's a little scary to be in a country where a fireball could take you out in your vehicle and nothing flat. Um, went the wrong way there. Okay, so here is the um, close up showing you the lowlands over in the Caribbean side, the lowlands on the Pacific side, um, and then the central high mountains. And of course the capital of Costa Rica being San Jose. Um, Spanish is the native language, but English is widely spoken um, primarily because of tourism, which is a major factor in their economy. Uh, Costa Rica is considered the Switzerland of Central America because it dissolved its armed forces in 1949. It has a strong economy, standard of living is high, has political stability, and a well-developed social benefit system. These assets set Costa Rica apart significantly from its Central American neighbors. There's a 97% literacy rate. It's a de democratic Republican republic with a president and vice president that are elected every four years. Many American uh, military couples retire here because they can have a very nice standard of living with a cook and a houseboy and a yard person um, at much lower co cost than in the States. Um, the other thing that's notable is that Costa Rica has protected approximately 28% of its land in national parks, reserves, and wildlife refuges. There are wonder, wonderful, a number of absolutely lovely, comfortable, charming eco lodges and resorts that just happen to have delicious food. So uh, let's go to Costa Rica. Now, this is Lake Arenal. You've heard me mention Arenal Volcano. 
This is a beautiful lake. It's also known for its windsurfing. There is Arenal in the background with pineapple fields in the foreground. Uh, obviously, pineapples are one of their major crops. Here is Arenal volcano at twilight. The first time I went to Costa Rica and went to Arenal Lodge, which is about two miles from, it's on a, a ridge, two miles from the volcano. We never even saw the volcano, but overnight, every night, it, the volcano rumbled. It is a primeval sound to hear a volcano rumble. You cannot not get out of bed and go look. But unfortunately, the whole time that we were there, the complete volcano was wreathed in clouds. So we never even saw it, but there was no doubt that it was there. I did see it subsequently. Uh, there it is in the daylight. Um, and that's rainforest all around it. Uh, some of the scenic things that are very much uh, aware of everywhere in, in Costa Rica are beautiful waterfalls. This is the La Paz waterfall gardens with a rainbow. This is such a beautiful place that you see that little pavilion down. People come over there to get married because it's such a beautiful natural setting. Um, Arenal volcano, of course, heats all the water that is are in the surrounding areas. I've been in these little waterfalls. They are about 98 degrees or 100 degrees. It's That's hot water you're looking at. Um, and of course, nobody's heating it except for except for Arenal Volcano. So um, I don't know why this occasionally just stops moving forward. All right. So one of the reasons we're here is to look at beautiful birds. Um, Costa Rica has documented about 894 species of birds. I'm not going to show you 894. You'll be glad to know that. Um, Tanagers are among the most beautiful birds that um, we see a lot of in Costa Rica. In, in the US, we have three tanagers. We have a summer tanager, we have a scarlet tanager, and we have a western tanager. There are 79 species of tanagers in Costa Rica, and you will see several of them in this uh, presentation. Boy, I, I, I don't understand why it... That, that's the call of the golden hooded tanager. Um, I, I will tell you that this is, um, I want to explain when you record bird songs in the US, if any of you were here for my presentation on birds of the Chicago area, you don't get any background noise because there isn't background noise. But when you're photographing birds in a rainforest, there's always background noise. The, the people who are re doing the recordings um, have to turn their sound up to pinpoint the individual bird they're trying. So you're always gonna hear the background noise. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. The green honey creeper, this is the male. This is one of the few birds where the species is actually named after the female because there's a chip note and birds have chip notes they have calls they have songs i try to give you what i think is the most representative but here's the female green honey creeper and she actually is green whereas as you can see um the male is not come on um they are all absolute crazy about about a fruit needless to say so moving right along uh, this is a bird that's well named for once. Um, a lot of birds are not particularly well named, but this red legged honey creeper is definitely red legged. And that's his call. There he is. Now these go down, these where you see uh, branches with, with a piece of banana on it. That goes for a bird feeder down in, in Costa Rica because the birds are much more much more interested in fruit than they are in uh, seed. But he was doing a nice job of showing me all of his colors as well as his red legs. This is a, a petite uh, hummingbird. Uh, this is a green crown, brilliant, and this is the male. The males and the females do not always look the same. I have to tell you that 
in the United States, we have just about one um, hummingbird. Uh, we all probably are familiar with it. Um, uh, Ruby-throated hummingbirds are around here most of the spring and summer and fall. They're all gone now. Um, but but in Costa Rica, there are there are 50 different hummingbirds. In in the whole of the New World, there are over 300 species of hummingbirds. So they are very very wonderful, very special. Having 50 is pretty good, but Ecuador, which is down in the northern part of South America, has 300 hummingbird species. So. Um, if you never will run out of looking uh, hummingbirds to look for. They don't have a great song, but here's a little bit. It's just more of a contact note. Here is a, the green crown, crown brilliant female feeding on uh, nectaring on some vervain, I think. There she is again showing off. This, this bird was feeding and I was just standing on the pathway. And I just stood there and took picture after picture. She kept going away and coming back and going away and coming back. Um, but she was a beauty and she's very cooperative. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this is a white neck Jacobin. This is, I was, one of my four trips to Costa Rica was a photography trip. And this was a, a professional setup by Steve Gettle uh, where he had like five, separate slave flashes, flashes that would fire at the same time as you as you press as I press the uh, shutter speed. So you can actually stop the bird's wings. Um, you can't do that handheld. Uh, anyway, this is a beautiful hummingbird. Also is a white neck Jacobin. This is a rufous tailed hummingbird. Once again, the same professional setup. This is outdoors. Uh, we're not in a zoo or anything. This is, you just put up in Costa Rica. You just put up some sugar water, and the hummingbirds come. I got a, a nice shot of him coming into the into the flower, and that flower is right there in front of the sugar water. This is a chattier hummingbird. There had been a green-breasted mango up in um, up in Wisconsin this year that uh, I took this picture and we went up to see it and we missed it. We sat for hours and waited and we went out to lunch and it came in while we were gone. So we just went down to, to Costa Rica and by gum, there we found a green, green bested mango and she's sitting on her, um, on her nice little nest there. Uh, that is about the size of a child's teacup. Of, of a hummingbird weighs an eighth of an ounce. So you can see that that is a teensy little bird. Now notice she's decorated her nest with lichen so that it, it blends right in with the tree. Here is uh, going from the sublime to the ridiculous are the teensy to the large collared arasari is a, an impressive bird that beak is, is not as heavy as you would think. If anything it's actually used for air conditioning but uh, this is what they sound like. They're very colorful birds. As you can see, there's a, a red, red rump, a yellow belly, a red, yellow, red, yellow belly band and the matching colors on the beak. He gave, there's a better look at his, his belly. And then there's the beautiful emerald toucanet. This is one of my favorite. Although because they are so green, they are hard to, to, to pick out for photographic purposes. I did get this guy. Um, um, just incredible colors, incredible colors. Here's a chestnut mandible toucan. Um, uh, just wonderful species. They're also, they also seem to have a, a sense of humor. They're absolutely uh, crazy about fruit. Here's a killbull kill toucan. What wonderful colors, what wonderful colors. The white rump, 
would show when it's flying, but is barely visible when they're not. Sounds different than the other guys. Here's um, um, Montezuma's Oropendula. Um, this is a, a good sized bird and they, they come in flocks and they nest in flocks. Um, the, the word Oropendula means golden oriole. And obviously, because oro uh, is the Spanish word for, for gold, he, they're pretty much referring to the bird's tail, uh, but golden, because golden orioles, there are such a thing as a golden oriole and they don't look like this. Anyway, I've, I've always thought of it as the hangover bird because it has such a big bag sort of looking thing that light blue under its eye. Uh, they, are, they have a wonderful call. That bubbly um, sound is just absolutely charming. They they do come to feeders. This this goes for a feeder, uh, eating bananas, and the, those are lianas that uh, come down from the various vi the vines that come down from the trees. There were a whole group of them that came into this feeder and they pretty much stripped the bananas bare and nothing flat. And this is, this is their um, communal nesting. These are woven nests that they, they weave with their, their beaks. And um, I'm told, although I, of course, one doesn't ever get up to uh, look in the nests of, a, of an oropendula because those are very high in the trees. But I'm told that the, the um, nests on the outside of the of the grouping of nests are, are fakes that uh, that way uh, th that the um, if, if anybody comes in the way of a, a raptor or something to get an egg or a baby uh, they find empty nests on the outside so this is the white-throated magpie jay um, you know we really only have one jay in this country um, but but um, the jays of the world are spectacular, absolutely spectacular. This one is one of the prettiest ones, but there are some that would just take your breath away. Uh, it has knocked me out. How many? How beautiful they are! Here's what the magpie jay sounds like. There's a better shot of them. Good sized bird, magnificent plumage. These are brown jays, obviously. Um, they, they sound more like the jays that we're familiar with. And then there's the black vultures. These are the birds that are nature's cleanup committee. Um, you notice that there is very little feathering on the vulture's head. That's because, as I think we all know, vultures dine on carrion. And um, you don't want to have to try to clean your feathers if you've been eating carrion. Uh, these vultures are amazing. They are, uh, in some parts of the world, particularly Southeast Asia, they've almost been extirpated. Uh, but they're, um, they are not the most divine of birds, and they certainly reek. They absolutely reek. But they are a necessity, and we're very glad we've got them. Here's what they sound like. Well, that's one going away. Must be all we're gonna get. This is a, one of a Central America's blackbirds called a groove-billed ani. Indeed, there is a smooth-billed ani. This, you can see the grooves in this guy. I, this does not sound like the, the song that should go with this bird, but I assure you it is. And now we're getting into the tanager family. The tanagers of this Costa Rica and, and Central and South America are absolutely wonderful. Passerini's or Sherry's tanager. There is the crimson collared tanager.
completely different sound. And this is the blackface tanager. And at a local feeder at one of the lodges we were staying at, the yellow thigh finch, which as you can see is for once well-named. And then one of the birds that you love if you're a photographer is a trogon. There are a number of different trogons around, but trogons are birds that sit, which is not typical of most birds. Anyway, this is a slaty tail trogon. Now he happened to be right over my head, which wasn't my preference, but um, I still managed to. Here's a better shot of him. Uh, you can see the squared off tail, the red, the red belly, and then the uh, breast uh, um, of green with a nice eye ring. Here's one of the most bizarre birds around. This is the great curacao. That is indeed a curly uh, feathered hairdo that it's got with that knob on his head. These are wandering around. I'm constantly amazed at why the sounds don't sound like the bird. Anyway, here's a, here's a better shot of the showing the curly hair of the curacao. And there's this lady friend. Um, she's hard to she's hard to focus on because of those all those lane, lines. But she's pretty in her own way. Once again, from the huge bird walking around the grounds, this is a common toady flycatcher. This is a bird that's about this big. And it's putting together a very tidy, well, right now it looks like a messy little nest. It ends up quite tidy. Anyway, here's what it says. This bird was sitting, building this nest in the bush right next to where we were having lunch at, a, at one of the lodges. And also up in the canopy was a Rufus Mott Mott. Uh, don't miss the long tail. The tail of the mot, mot goes all the way down to the bottom of the picture. There's an area where the um, feathering on the tail disappears. And then there's this little, what they call a racket at the bottom. Anyway, this guy has wonderful eye makeup and, and a stick pin. That's what the spot on the chest is called and lovely coloring, Rufus mot, mot. I love the sound. It sounds like you can hear another one calling back. And this is a jabberoo. This bizarre looking creature is uh, about four feet tall. Um, it, they can inflate that neck pouch. Um, and uh, they're absolutely bizarre. I, I didn't find a call. I, I In order to get the calls of the birds, I use a, a, a a site called Zeno Canto. And I didn't get a call out of this bird, but they gave me this, which I think sounds like the, the bird uh, clacking his bill. It's not proper to call them jabberoo storks. They are just jabberoo, but they are indeed storks. And this is a nest. Now this is very high up in the tree. And you can see here is the adult. And then there's one, two, three little babies in that nest. And they're way up there, way up there. But it was a, and this a humongous nest as you can see. No call on that. This is a squirrel cuckoo and sorry, but birds just tend to hide right behind the one branch, right where that cuckoo's bill is supposed to be. He's got it right behind that branch. But uh, these are marvelous and they, they do move around very quickly through the foliage, much like squirrels, which is why they're named that way. So then we ran across a sooty thrush. Now, some of you may know that our American robin isn't a robin and all, it's a, th at all it's a thrush. 
Uh, so this would be in the same family as our American Robin. He's obviously named Sooty for his coloration. And here's his call. Here's the laughing falcon, has that nice white mask. And then down in the lowland areas, um, found some roseate spoonbills. We can see roseate spoonbills actually in this country. Uh, I've seen them down in Florida, but they are um, obviously named for their bill, which is, is spatulate. And, uh, and for the pretty color that they achieve. Um, they don't, when they're babies, they're not as colorful as they are now, or as they grow up. This is the perfect representation of the prettier the bird, the more awful the call and vice versa. Then this darling black neck stilt, we get, occasionally get, black neck stilts up here in the summertime. They're very elegant and refined. And they, they come around in great large groups in shallow water. Beautiful birds. And these are uh, some cattle egrets. Um, and these are in breeding plumage. Their, their plumes get longer and more um, fluffy. And as you can see, the one over here has a little plume off the back of his head. Anyway, this would be, um, this would have been their, their breeding plumage time. We do have cattle egrets in this country. And now we're up in the mountains uh, at a, a lodge called Savegre. Here's a colored white start or red start. Sitting right outside my door when I came out for breakfast one morning. And then he went down on the grass and caught himself a butterfly for his own breakfast. He was just a cute little guy. And then by gum, we had an acorn woodpecker. These are particularly uh, whimsical looking woodpeckers. Um, you know, we are familiar with our downy and our hairy and our red bellied and even our red headed. Uh, there are actually acorn woodpeckers in a few areas out in uh, far Western California. Here's what they sound like. Here's another shot giving you a better look at them. Just such charming looking birds. These are so cryptic, I almost couldn't find them to photograph them. They're down in the leaf litter. They're spot, spotted wood quail and um, they really blend in. And in the same area, I spotted this gray-breasted wood wren, also very cryptic, also fits right in and you just can barely, barely spot them. And um, then there's a great kiskadee. Now this is a bird that's supposed to say its name. I'm, I'm not so sure that it does, but give it a, give it a listen. Almost kiskadee at the end there. There it is, kiskadee. Okay. And here, I've never seen one. This, this blew me away. This has got, a, this bird has a flat head. But when I got this picture, I, I saw that when they get alarmed, they raise a crest. So uh, that was a fun discovery of mine. I'm not gonna put you through that sound again. Here's the beautiful uh, silver-throated tanager. And it is not a mistake in the photograph. The bird actually does have some green feathering on his back. 
kind of high whis whispery call, what you'd expect from that sort of a bird. But there he is, look at that green. The Tanager family is just incredible. Here's the blue gray Tanager. And now we get into some hummingbirds. This is a green violet ear. And it, it, what you don't see too well in this picture is that little violet below his eye is actually fluffed out uh, so that he's, he's making a show. Um, and whether he's, he's probably fighting another male to get at the feeder, uh, but uh, get... hummingbirds as little as they are are very feisty and they, they will chase other birds away from their feeder. They're also beautiful. And look at the coloration in that tail. And then the same, the violet on, up around the ear. Just amazing. And at some of the lodges, they don't mess around. They um, imagine having three violet ear hummingbirds coming to your feeder. And then this is another one, a different species because of that, that uh, aqua throat. This is a green violet ear at rest with, with his, his ear thing, not patched, not fluffed out. And this is this was really nice. It was it started to rain. This is when we were trying to take those photographs with the um, the professional setup with the five slave uh, flashes. This hummingbird it started to rain, and this hummingbird just came and sat and just had a shower. It was such a pretty pretty shot. So moving right along to some remarkable reptiles, we've got um, the the elegant and co colorful basilisk lizard. He's got these lovely light blue spots and the flange and the everything going for him. He's also called the Jesus Christ lizard. And this, they're not being defamatory when they say that. It's because this, this reptile actually walks on water. And there's what he does. I did not take this picture, I will be honest to tell you. But I had seen it done. I just you're, You got to be fast to get this. This was also at a lodge. This is an enormous iguana. This guy's probably the size of, a, of an adult male human being. He is just, but, but they're, they're herbivores. So they're, they have, you can see the huge claws. You can see the, the waddle. You can see the spikes. They're, they're kind of terrifying looking, but they're really very gentle. And, and he was, this was, this was up about four or five, five feet. He was able to get up on that ledge to get the fruit. Then we uh, encountered these, these red-eyed tree frogs are, um, are nocturnal. So I photographed these at night, uh, which has its own challenges, but they are wonderful and they're just amazing. These are not, these guys are about this big. This is a leaf frog or a red-eyed tree frog. I kind of like red-eyed tree frog. And this is the same frog as this one when he's all hunkered down for uh, camouflage, when he's either sleeping or he's, he's frightened. This is a green and black poison dart frog. Uh, these are also very small, but very highly poisonous. These are also all um, nocturnal. So we were out uh, at night picking these up. You didn't want to pick them up, that's for sure. But they call him a blue jeans because of his blue bottom or a strawberry frog. And then here was a very much more cryptic frog. This is the Mexican tree frog. And here's a green anole lizard. These, these creatures are just there in Costa Rica. It, it's, it, it's amazing. This is a short nosed vine snake and you can see why it's called the, the vine snake. Uh, I don't think he was poisonous. He's just, just hanging out. This one is poisonous. This is a Bushmaster. And uh, there was an open aired place where we could view and photograph this guy. He was not just out and about. Uh, he is, he's a big snake and, um, and very dangerous. And this, this is his head. 
So you can see he's wrapping himself around. And this is this is the Bushmaster un, unwinding himself. And, and, and as you can see, blending into his, his background very, very well and successfully, which makes them all the more dangerous. This is a helmet head lizard. Can you see him? His eye is the upper left-hand corner. Um, and you can see his tail down here. He's pretty well camouflaged. The red circle shows the body. Here's the leg. Oops, sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so helmet head lizard. Eyelash palm pit viper. These, uh, these vipers like, they, they actually have eyelashes. Um, you can't quite see it in that shot. I think you can see it. A little bit of eyelash right there. And there you see a little bit of eyelash. And they hang out on heliconia, which are these beautiful foliage plants. And, and basically they try to catch and eat hummingbirds because the hummingbirds come to the eyelash, come to the heliconia to nectar. And these guys blend in so well. So this uh, is a spiny lizard. We found him up, uh, up high in the mountains that we'd gone to a place to photograph some birds. And this is, this is the female spiny lizard. And here's the orange kneed tarantula. And now we're moving along to marvelous mammals. Imagine that you're standing alone in the jungle and you hear this awful sounding beast. And this actually happened to me. Listen to this. I'm standing by myself. The group has left me. And I'm hearing this thinking, is this, is this a bear? Is this a, 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 a giant cat? Guess what it is? A howler monkey. Howler monkeys are everywhere. And the big males are the ones that do that, make that noise. Anyway, they go through the trees and they yell and howl. And it's just, they're, they're really very funny. But it was pretty terrifying at one point for me. There are also squirrel monkeys. I've been in, a, most of the lodges have open air dining areas. So I, one breakfast, a whole flock of spy, spider, squirrel monkeys came roaring through our dining area and, and literally took food off of our plates and kept going. Anyway, these are uh, adults with, with babies on their backs. And here's a three-toed sloth with a baby hanging onto its belly. It's a pretty good size baby, but uh, anyway, mom was working its way up the tree. Here's another sloth. They come down once a week to do their business. This guy was coming down to do his business and he got off on a limb and couldn't get to the ground. So that was very perturbing because sloths move very slowly. Anyway, this was a little ocelot that we did get a look at. Looks just almost like a domestic cat, doesn't it? Collared peccaries are quite a, quite a bit about, uh, they are not dangerous, but oh my, do they smell. You can you can walk you can hear them before you can smell them or hear them or see them. you can smell them before you can see them or hear them is what I'm trying to say. Here's a quadamundi. This is kind of the Central American uh, raccoon. Uh, they're awful cute, and uh, they're very big on strawberries. They came up to eat strawberries to our vehicle, and here were a pair just wrapped around each other having a little snuggle. And, and they, they really are cute, cute guys. And here was a variegated square squirrel on a liana. These are, these are Central American vines. Now more fabulous birds, purple throated mountain gem. They don't call them hummingbirds because they know they are hummingbirds. This is the purple throated mountain gem female. That's a, uh, this is, it seems kind of unfair that the female isn't very pretty. This is a perfectly beautiful hummingbird that it's hard to photograph that, that uh, throat. The violet saber wing. 
flame colored tanagers. This is the male. You rarely get two birds in the same picture, but this, uh, the female was hanging out with the male, so I got them together. Notice, notice how, how nicely they match the flower. This is a common bush tanager, not a very pretty bird. This is considered one of the most beautiful birds in the world, and I would have to go along with it. This is the resplendent Quetzal, and we happen to be at Sabegre Lodge in the Highlands when this male and his lady friend were flirting. They're about to, they're about to get together and have babies. This male has a tail that goes all the way down out of the picture. He's supposed to have two long tail feathers, but unfortunately, somewhere along the line, he lost one of them. And this guy was at the nesting hole and he was calling. And there you can see his bright coloration and the lovely featheration along his, the side of his body. And this is indeed the nesting hole. And in the foreground, here's the female. This was remarkable from a photographic standpoint with birds to get a bird of this significance. And notice the green tail of, of this, the male goes all the way down to here. Oh, come on, Mary Lou. The tail goes all the way down to there and he'll have to grow another tail, which I'm sure he will do. The female is going to have him even though he only has one feather. She made it, made it abundantly clear. Um, so there he is again, you can see just the one tail feather. Uh, and then uh, we did run into some scarlet macaws. These are the same ones that are in this painting above my head. Um, these are wonderful birds and very rocket. Come on, speak to us. There it is. We had a lot of macaws in the Pantanal trip, which I'll be doing uh, sometime in the, uh, 2021 for the library. You want to see that one. Here's the long tailed silk flycatcher. This was up in the mountains and this silky flycatcher was eating these berries. Now you'd think named uh, flycatcher it wouldn't be eating berries, but it was. Just such a pretty bird. Such a pretty bird. Here's this lady flower piercer. It, it, notice the beak. It has a kind of a little decurved uh, tip and it, it goes, it doesn't go into the from the front of the flower, it goes into the base of the flower with that pierce, piercing uh, beak. And a nice high little call like you'd expect of a, a little bird like that. This is the flame-throated warbler. We're up in the mountains here. There's uh, the flame-throated and there's another one down here, I think comes out later. We don't, we don't see, we get warblers in this country, but none that look like this. And at the very end, we have a darling mottled owl hiding in the bamboo. This is at the, one of the uh, grounds of one of the lodges we stayed at. So we'll just do a little quick rundown on the foliage and the flowers. They are absolutely beautiful everywhere. These are orchids. This is just beautiful red and green. There's a lot of red and green in nature. Just beautiful plants, trees in flower. Torch lilies were everywhere. Flowers, flowers, flowers. Beautiful split leaf philodendron. There's, there's a different color heliconia than I showed you before. This, this, is, this, this is not a, a child. This is a grown woman. This is how huge the foliage is. And so we say a fond farewell to this lovely friendly country, a sweet local pooch, a mother hen with her teensy chicks. And the crocodile says, hasta la vista, Costa Rica. And that's it, folks.
and I'm finished. That was wonderful, Mary Lou. What a treasure trove of nature in that country. Oh, it is. It's amazing. And I, there's a lot more that I couldn't photograph or didn't get good shots of. So thank you. Um, anyway, I'm so grateful to all of those of you who came. And um, I would be delighted to answer questions, but I will have to tell you ahead of time, I'm not a, I'm not a, a ornithologist and I'm not a biologist. I'm just simply a an enthusiastic birder and I've been birding for about 20 years and I have literally been all over the world in pursuit of birds and it's been a fabulous avocation. My only regret is that I didn't start birding sooner. So are there any thoughts or comments? Everybody can unmute themselves, can't they now, Terry? Uh, yes, they can unmute themselves and then I will read the questions from the- Oh, chat. you've got some questions, good, okay. Yeah, we do have some questions. Um, well, there was a question on Thursday's program and when will it be replayed? Um, check the December calendar. We'll be putting it on the first week of December. It did not get in on the December's newsletter, but it'll be there the first week of December. And then this program recording will be uh, towards the end of December. I'm gonna try to make it available sooner. Just check our calendar. Um, one of the patrons asked, are you familiar with the caravan tours of Costa Rica and can you recommend them? I'm not, I don't, I don't know them at all. Um, and I don't know what to say, except everybody uses TripAdvisor. There's my downstairs neighbor deciding to do some um, renovation work, unfortunately. Um, I don't know caravan tours, but I think TripAdvisor is an awfully good uh, thing to look things over. Um, I. I don't, I don't know what else to say. All right, there's another question here. What do you mean when you said the sloth was coming down to do his business? Was he oh, coming down to eat? They, oh, no, they, they, they defecate once a week. <laughs> so, so he was coming down to do it and he went out on a long tree limb and didn't get to the ground. And of course, they're too, the, trees, the trees are where they live. They're not gonna do it there. So he had to go all the way, and they're so slow. It was so painful to see him coming all the way back along the branch and then go slowly down the tree. He finally got down to the ground. Wow. <laughs> um, there's another question. Fabulous presentation. Did the plant with the huge leaves have thorns? No, no, because she was holding it. Uh, yeah, no, and I'm, I'm not a botanist either, but I just... I just thought that those, those were enormous leaves, but she was touching them. All right, there's a lot of other comments that are um, just saying, thank you so much for this presentation. It's breathtaking, beautiful to see, wonderful. Oh, yeah, truly marvelous. Well, I, I thank everybody who came. Um, and I am going to be doing another presentation in December. I think it's December 16th. It's Monday, uh, December 14th. Oops, sorry. One o'clock. <laughs> at one o'clock. And, and this one is uh, Greece. This is oh. um, Athens, Greece, um, the, uh, a par the Parthenon and the Old Town. And then we went over to the island of Lesvos which is an island that's just a couple of miles from Turkey. Um, but the birding is remarkable and it's the best uh, birding in the Mediterranean because it's on the far Eastern end of the Mediterranean. Uh, because, so, because it's, it's not extremely well known, so it's not crowded and, uh, and it's a charming island with a wonderful monastery. It's a fascinating, fascinating destination too. So uh, I hope a lot of you will come back for that. So another, um, there's another question here, Mary Lou. What was your favorite birding adventure? Oh, um, well, it, 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 I'm going to be doing it for this group, but you tell me I'm not doing it till March. Is that right, Terry? Brazil? Yeah. Uh, actually, no, I'm wrong about that. Oh, March, okay. March is the birds of Britain. Okay. Um, February. Nope. I have that wrong again. I'm sorry, I need to check this. I should, I've got it on my calendar. I can look it up. January, we're going to Brazil. 
Okay. Okay. So, so yes, there, there is, I've been to Brazil. First of all, I love tropical birding. I've been to Brazil birding at least three or four times, but the highlight of my, of my, all my trips to Brazil and, and everything that I've done in South America is, is the Pantanal, which is, it's the largest tropical wetlands in the world. And it is um, uh, in central Brazil, uh, it's not easy to get to, but it is, um, and it's because it's a wetland, you have to go there during the dry season, um, but it has got all kinds of wonderful birds and uh, critters and, and, uh, and jaguars, live jaguars, not in a zoo. I mean, jaguars out and about. It was really, this is really a treat. This, and I've given this presentation a few times. I'm sorry, the guy's still doing stuff. <laughs> But yeah, I really love the Pantanal in Brazil. But that will you know, be it's Monday, all... Monday, January 25th. And the okay. good news is you're actually doing a program for us every month now through March. So we'll be going to a different country uh, oh. every month now through March. Well, I hope you'll all come back and join me. All right, there's I, one I... more question here. Did you organize the trip on your own or go on a tour to Costa Rica? Oh, um, the first two times I went to Costa Rica, I I hired. Uh, there were four of us, and we went. Um, we we had a, a a tour operator who met us at the airport, took us to the first lodge, plopped us down there for three or four days. Then we went to another lodge. He took us there. Then we went up into the mountains. So those were independent trips that we did. You could do that very nicely. I wouldn't recommend doing it on your own in Costa Rica because. The driving, the roads are not marked, uh, so you wouldn't find your way around. So, but it's it's very reasonable to have um, a local tour operator. They they book the, the hotels for you, the lodges for you, and then they take you around, and then you're on your own. The lodges have their own tour guides, and so on and so forth. The third trip I went was a solid birding trip that was um, with a, an Illinois birder, Vern Clean. And uh, we did the Caribbean side. Oh, so hot. Oh, so hot. It was a wonderful birding trip. And Vern's a great guy. But I, I would stay away from the Caribbean side unless you like hot and humid. And then the fourth trip, I went uh, on a photo trip uh, with a, a photographer by the name of Steve Gettle. So, um, and, and I, you know, I go back there any way, shape, or form. I like going on a bird trip because you see more birds than you're going to find on your own. But most of the eco lodges have their own tour guides, their own birding guides. So always a good thing to check that out ahead of time. So I couldn't, I couldn't recommend it more, to be honest with you. So. Is there a better time of year to go? Oh, yeah. You, you don't want to get to Costa Rica in the rainy season. Um, and I want to say that's December to April is when you want to be there in the dry season. But, um, you know, I, I, you could find that out. Darn it, I'm sorry. I, I'm pretty sure that's December to April, but uh, you'd have to look that up. There, there is a rainy season. It's, it's almost on the equator. It's going to be hot in the lowlands and pleasant in the mountains most of the time. But you don't you don't want to be there because when it rains it really really rains and uh, that that would be findable in any in any tour tour um, book uh, most most of the tour people that are offering tours would all, always be offering you a tour during the dry season because nobody wants to go there and sit and get rained on because boy in the tropics it sure knows how to rain sorry I can't answer that one I I. I've always been there, I think, in January and February, but uh, that's the best I can, rem I can remember for now. Another question here is, have you been to the Pacific lowlands? Are they as hot and humid? Yes, uh, and, and what I also didn't mention uh, is there's actually in the, the Pacific Northwest, there's actually desert-like conditions. I have never been there. I have been on the uh, Pacific uh, uh, side, down on the beaches, and there are some wonderful, um, some wonderful 
places to go, natural places to see birds. Uh, but I, um, I don't recall. It isn't. It isn't as hot as it is on the on the Caribbean side, uh, but but it, it is hot. Um, I do remember going to look for some particular parrot down here over here on this side somewhere, and uh, walking around in this in the heat and going across the river to a lodge and sitting and drinking a beer, and having the parrot fly right over our head. So we thought. Well, the better thing to do is to stay here and drink beer than it was to go out in the heat. Yeah, it's hot down on the lows, but but uh, now and I've stayed at a lodge down here in the um, area, almost in in Panama, and it you can swim in the beaches, you get ocean waves, and and go up into the mountains. It's it's perfectly fine. I I had it was for me it was too hot over on the Caribbean side, but this side is is very tolerable. That was the last question, I think, Mary Lou. Um, a lot of thank yous for the wonderful escape and oh, great. for a wonderful presentation. Well, thanks, thanks to all for joining me. I loved being with you and sharing it. And uh, I hope when all this COVID is over, some of you get to Costa Rica because it's really a fun trip. So um, thank you all for coming. I hope I'll see you in December. And uh, thanks, Terry, to you as well. You're welcome. And, Thank you very much. And happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>